as Jeremiah preaches to Jerusalem and Judah in their last days before God brings in the Babylonian captivity. He speaks to a number of the nations round about them, basically saying, yes, Judah is being punished because it would not sin, but you Gentile countries, you can't think you're going to escape either. And so when you come down to verse 7 of Jeremiah 49, the prophet says, concerning Edom, well, Edom the people, the inhabitants of Edom were descendants of Esau. Concerning Edom, thus saith the Lord of hosts, is wisdom no more in Teman? Is counsel perished from the prudent? Is their wisdom vanished? Then he says, flee ye, turn back, Dwell deep, O inhabitants of Dedan. Now the point I want to make. For I will bring the calamity of Esau upon him, the time that I will visit him. The calamity of Esau. Now, for years, I think this passage of Jeremiah 49 8, for those who know their Old Testament, know the patriarchal age, and the characters and inspirations given us, have meditated on that for a moment, maybe far more than a moment. The calamity of Esau. Because here he's discussing the destruction of the nation of Edom, which descended from Esau. And thus he promises to bring the calamity of Esau upon their very immoral, decadent society. Now if you want to read about him, you need to go back to Genesis chapter 25, that is, about Esau. And you basically learn there to put it in common parlance, the high price of a bowl of soup. Because he sold his birthright for that. That bowl of soup basically was lentils. He thought he was starving to death. We don't appreciate like they did that birthright. But it meant all for them. And he was hungry. He could satisfy his hunger. He could wait a little longer. He could got what he wanted. No. Jacob... He'll catch her. His brother sold him that simply for physical refreshment. This profane man sold his birthright. Now, what does that tell us about the descendants of him? About as mundane and anybody could be or as he was. Now, what's interesting when you come way down years and years later to the times of the New Testament, and as far as history is concerned, even before the record of the New Testament begins, we all are familiar with the Herodian family, especially Herod the Great, but throughout the book of Acts, we're exposed to descendants of Herod the Great. They occupied the very dubious distinction of being the offspring of Esau. May not realize that, but they are. There's some Jewish blood in them, but they are from Idumea. Actually, they were known as Idumean Arabs. And if you read about these characters, you see they were just about as shallow and carnal as their ancient kinsmen had been. So I asked myself the question, why did God write this in the Bible. We sometimes sing with the children about Nadab and Abihu, and we say they are an example, and we quickly point out a negative example. Don't deal with God as they did. 
Well, the calamity of Esau evidently refers mainly to the thought that's contained over in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 17. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now, there's a difference in views of whether this refers to Esau's own change of mind or his father's principle. It's the same. I always thought it referred to Esau, who sought repentance with tears, but it already messed up and he couldn't go back on it. And at least this comes out. And this we should all think deeply about. Some people wait too long to make things right. Some people wait too long to make things right. The chasm between them and where they are in error and what they must do to be right with God is just more than they're willing to put forth the effort to cross. There are various passages that bring out this sentiment to where it becomes too difficult for people in the sense of the adjustments, radical adjustments that must be made to their life to turn from sin and embrace the truth. Notice these passages that tie right in with the calamity of Esau. Paul writes to the Ephesian brethren discussing their state of affairs before the gospel reached them. In Ephesians 4 and verse 19, he said, uh, they are past feeling. Past feeling. If you look at uh, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 2, here are people who heard and from the heart obeyed the gospel, but now we see that they've departed from the faith. And in describing what went on in their inward man, he says their conscience has been seared with a hot iron. That means it's past feeling. When they do surgery on you, whether it's minor surgery or whatever, they put you in a position where you can't feel what they're doing to you. We've all probably had some cut sewed up or something, and they deadened it, as we call it. You couldn't feel it. But he's talking about spiritually here. And in Zechariah 7, 12, to go back to the Old Testament, he describes people like this saying their hearts are as an adamant stone. And in John 8, 21, our Lord talked about to the Jews, except you believe that I am he, that is the Messiah, the anointed one, ye shall die in your sins. Which means they had the power to receive the evidence that proved Christ is the Son of God, but they were not using it. They were not paying attention to the evidence. They were not honest with themselves, with God, and with the evidence. And then John, in writing to Christians in 1 John 5, 16, talks about the sin unto death. Well, what sin is that? It's a sin a brother won't confess. You won't admit you're wrong when you know you're wrong. You mean we can get ourselves in that state? Yeah, we sure can. Jacob and Esau in the patriarchal age were equivalent to members of the church today. All men approached God through the heads of the families who acted as God's spokesman, who acted as the principal one to offer sacrifices and guidance to the home. And that's where they were. And since John's writing to Christians in 1 John 5 and verse 16, that means, and he's talking to Christians, conduct of Christians that means we can so change ourselves as the truth relates to us as we allow it to impact us it won't make any difference we just won't change we are past feeling our consciences have been seared with a hot iron our hearts are like an adamant stone and if we stay that way we will die in our sins that's the sin and the death. A heart that cannot admit I have sinned and I'm turning away from it. 
I'm not going to live like that any longer. These, these hearts here that we're talked about in these passages will not say that. They're past feeling. They can't be pricked. Those people on the Pentecost were devout Jews. But they learned they were wrong, but they were honest-hearted, Luke 8, verse 15. And they were pricked in their heart, Acts 2, verse 37, by the truth spoken that condemned them. Label them murderers. They didn't want that. The finality of the verses I've just noted really present what I think is a powerful argument for us to never harden our heart. Hebrews 3 and verse 15. When we do that, we're really shutting the door of heaven to ourselves. Matthew 25, 10 through 13. Now the thing about it is, is that we all tend to apostatize gradually. You just don't find anywhere in the Bible a man real strong in the Lord, such as the Apostle Paul and his zenith of faithfulness, and the next day is a Judas Iscariot. I think you would find, if you could study the years, that Judas Iscariot was with the Lord, that if you could really know him when he was first chosen, there was a big difference in him when he denied or when he saw the Lord. People change. I have the power to change. It would be ridiculous to not have the power of the change. Why would we be here this afternoon? Why would we want to study the Bible for ourselves? Why would we want to be in a Bible class? Why would we want to be teachers? If we didn't intend to offer information from God that gives a person a chance to change. When we reject the truth of God that applies to us, we're telling God, I do not accept what you say to me. I don't believe it. So what are some of the pitfalls that ultimately, now we're back to the title of this lesson, ultimately produce the calamity of Esau? Now I haven't gone specifically into the definition of a calamity. We have a figure from our old west called Calamity Jane, a person who really lived, but it usually means uh, an upsetting situation. Troublesome times have come, this kind of thing. So why do some people get their lives in such a mess? So that repentance seems to be, seems to be impossible. At least they have gone so far and the chasm is so wide between them and where they are and what they need to do to be acceptable to God that they, for all practical purposes, they're not going to make that change. I think there are several reasons. And when you read about Esau, you can think about it more. Now, I don't think these are all the reasons, but nevertheless, they're the major reasons. First of all, evil associations. Evil associations cannot lead to good things. They don't lead you to heaven. They don't show you how to live righteously. They will lead you to calamity. Paul, in writing the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, said, Evil companionship corrupt good morals. What is that saying? A steady, continued influence upon our lives by people who are worldly and ungodly can and will sap our spirituality. It'll make us be interested in what they're interested in and they're not interested in God. And they're not interested in the Bible. They're not interested in righteous living. They're just doing, you might say, what comes naturally. Sometimes parents, after their children have gotten older, wonder why their children have become the servants of Satan. A lot of it's because parents didn't know what God said they ought to be doing when it comes to training children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and setting a godly example before them, teaching and training them, disciplining them properly. 
seeing that they do what they ought to do. And yes, even at times being punished because they did wrong, that is the purview of the home. There are things the home can do that the church can't do, the state can't do, and ought not do. Now, of course, if parents don't do their part or children have a good and godly home but reject it, and they get out and break the law, the state will take over. But we should be thinking about the fact that we want to keep ourselves as close to godly things as possible, and that means godly companions. But these people in the church sometimes aren't very, about all the Christianity they've got to them is assembling with the saints most of the time or sometimes. But we ought to keep in mind, and it can't be said enough, the Bible classes and even the worship assemblies are just part and parcel. Important, yes, very important. Wouldn't denigrate their importance at all. But they're part and parcel of the rest of the week where day by day we choose what strengthens us or what brings us low in spiritual matters. It's not a pleasant thing in working with churches here and there and being around folks to see parents who they've grown, maybe even after their children left home, but their children aren't living right. And now there are parents who have grown spiritually who see these things they should have done and didn't. They lament the fact that their children are in a state of affairs and seemingly cannot be turned. The calamity of Esau has come upon them through evil associations. We need to remember that light and darkness do not blend. It's either light or darkness, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. So we ought to expose ourselves to the light of truth, truth of the gospel, truth of godliness, if we're going to keep ourselves from the calamity of Esau. Then there is where do we place our emphasis? Because our emphasis in life can lead to a calamity. You should be able to see that all around you without any effort whatsoever. Jesus reminded us that our heart and its treasure shape our destiny, our eternal destiny. Matthew 6, 21 and Mark 8, 36. For where a man's heart is, there will his treasure be also. If you care for this world, the things of this world, and satisfying self is self's motivated by the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and one gets overlooked a lot, the pride or vainglory of life, then you're not apt to love the Bible very much. Spend time with it, much time in prayer, a lot of time with the brethren to understand what fellowship is with God and with your brethren. When Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom, being that they were a pastoral people of flocks and herds, that was his business. That's what he did for a living, so to speak. And he and Abraham had a great living because they were wealthy in their time. Have you ever asked why did he pitch his tent toward Sodom? Well, he did not necessarily say, there's Sodom, what a wonderful place. I want to raise my children up there. But he looked at the well-watered plains of the Jordan, a wonderful place for herds and flocks. But in choosing the well-watered plains and the grassy plains and so on for flocks and herds, he actually had to pitch his tent toward Sodom. Now, Peter, by inspiration, says he was a righteous man and the terrible immoral lifestyle of Sodom vexed his righteous life from day to day. But the point is, you'll notice that he lost his wife. And look what a mess he made out of his, his daughters as far as their upbringing. Yes, he, he was saved from that mess. But look at what fell by the wayside. 
And you can't help but say, did the calamity of Esau come upon him? In this case, the calamity of Sodom, uh, of Lot, because he, he chose a lifestyle. He chose a job, the way we'd say it nowadays, that placed him in a very bad situation. That's a monumental decision, what you're going to do with your life and how you earn your living. And Matthew 6.33 has to be applied there like it does anything else that you decide to do. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Some people who never intended to be corrupt make these little day-by-day -day compromises that eventually cause them to care more for this present world for money than they once did for honesty. You cannot serve God and mammon. You're going to either hate one, love the other, or vice versa. Many divorces have resulted from women. And just think about the average workplace. Who is so-called, if there is such a thing, innocent flirtations with people, creating a situation that they didn't really begin to do, but that's what it developed into. Or some men tell off-color jokes, cute little things, at the coffee break or whatever, and one thing leads to the other. You know, rarely does adultery and fornication just say, here's a strong moral person, but the next minute, boom. If you've got a strong moral person and one who's going to try to get you to engage in morality, you've got an account like Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Because that strong moral young man, when she made her move on him, ran from her. In his mind, he was saying, how can I do this great sin before God? That's what you want. But that doesn't, that doesn't just happen by wishing it. So there's another thing. What, where do we, what, what do we emphasize in our life? Will it lead me closer to service to God? Or will it end up with the calamity of Esau? And then the last one. And if you look at the clock, it says about 22 till back there. So you may get out a little early. It's all according to how, not inspired by the Holy Spirit, but how inspired I get by something I say that leads me off on a tangent. The last point is, quit laughing, Mark. Mark, I don't even know your name. Brett, not being where we ought to be <laughs> brings calamity. Also calling people by the wrong name brings calamity. <laughs> now let me emphasize it. Not being where we ought to be brings calamity. The calamity of Esau. These many times are the sins of omission. I know I ought to do it, but I'm not doing it. James in James 4, 17 says, Him that knoweth the good, good and doeth it not, it is sin. We would do well to check our lives on the things we know God obligates us to do but we're not doing them think about King David now if you read that whole account of his and properly I say it affair with Bathsheba you'll notice it'll tell you that when, at the time of the year when kings were out with their armies doing battle that sets the scene. David was not where he ought to have been. And the next thing you see is he's up on top of the house. Well, understand their houses were their verandas, their, their porches. They spent lots of time up there. It was cool. That's where Peter was. He received his vision in Acts 10. So they weren't made just like the top of our houses. But that's where he was when he looked over and saw Bathsheba. Taking a bath. Well, you can get on Bathsheba's case if you want to, but 
David initiated the whole thing. 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. May have seen innocent at first, but no, everything's set in motion by his will. And when we forsake the assembling of ourselves to gather Christians, as a matter of some is, we're not where we ought to be. And we can be walking around on top of the house, and somebody in some form or fashion we may see taking a bath. So when we don't assemble with the saints, we not only miss worship and exhortation that comes from that worship, that strengthens us as we all worship God together, as we hear messages from God's word, as we're taught even by the songs, we hear the prayers and participate in them. We're just simply taking down one of the things that is meant to fortify us we're leaving ourselves, in other words, wide open to opportunities for the devil to get our mind on him. Now, the devil's going to take advantage of all of that. I still wish we really appreciated what it meant that the devil is a roaring lion, goeth about seeking him and may devour. I wish we'd realize that means every split second of every minute of every hour of every day, that's what he does. That's his business. And he's good at it. So after several occasions like this, missing services now and then, it gets to be more so, our conscience is not as tender as it once was. There's another thing that ties into the same thing. Those who assemble all the time, they never miss a service. But what have you trained your mind to do in each act of worship? When we're singing, are you really thinking about the words of those songs? Because remember, when you read Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16, it says that we're teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. Is that what we're doing? Or has it become just sort of what we do and our heart's really not in it. The prayer, are we thinking about other things as the leader leads? Are we praying our own prayers as we're led in prayer? Did we plan before we came to service according to how we've been prospered what we were going to give and gladly give it, not grudgingly? Are we looking for opportunities to grow in that area? Lord's Supper, where is our mind? On the front of this table, it says, This do in remembrance of me. Remember. Can't remember what you never knew. Well, I think everybody knows it's a Christian what Christ did. Do we remember him? Have we worked out things in our mind to help us concentrate on what the bread means, on what the fruit of the vine means, that we can meditate on it and thereby show forth his death till he come again? So see, we can do the same thing even though we're here all the time. We're here in body, not so much in spirit. Paul said concerning corrective discipline in the church at Corinth that when you deal with this one who had his father's wife like you ought to, like the Bible says, and he told them what to do, he says, you know that my spirit is with you. What did that mean? That Paul's spirit left his body and went over to Corinth and was there? No, it meant that you have apostolic uh, backing, if you please. I'm for it. It's right. It ought to be done. It's for the good of the church. It's for the good of the person that's sinned. So it comes down to where you can be absent from the assembly, but your body's still there. If you don't mentally participate in every act of worship. And the same thing's true of the sermon. You have to, Christianity is a taught thing, it's a trained thing. You have to train yourself to listen. You have to train yourself to participate, to worship God in spirit and in truth. So what I'm saying is, is that you can literally absent yourself bodily from the assembly 
We usually think of that in Hebrews 10.25, that some did that, and it's a sin to do it. But I'm saying also there's another side of the coin, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And that means I can be here fleshly, but my mind is somewhere else. It's not on what's going on in the worship. And I might as well not be here. Now the point about all this is, is that Satan has an easier time reaching us. And of course his ultimate uh, goal is to ruin us by getting us into sin we won't repent of. And that's the point of this lesson. The calamity of Esau has reached us if all that happens. It's overwhelmed us. It's brought us into bondage through sin. And we go on and on and on. I forgot what somebody said was the percentage of people who will obey the gospel if they get past uh, 20 years old. But the percentage is real high. It grows way up for those who will not obey the gospel when they're young. Remember now, thy creator, in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the days draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Why would that happen as a person gets older? They condition themselves. It's that simple. They condition themselves. You know, it's amazing. I go over here to the gym, try to six days a week. Because the doctor says it's good for me. I guess it is. And the Bible said bodily exercise profiteth little. I see people over there. They're there too. And they stay a long time and they put themselves through all sorts of gyrations and lifting weights and whatever they do. Trying to get big old muscles. And I wonder sometimes if I could see their spirit right out beside their body, what would it look like? I don't know that I'd want to see it. I don't know that I'd want to see it. But it shows where our emphasis is. And if we could pull our spirits out today and look at them as to are they strong, like people make their bodies strong, what would they look like? Are they exercised into godliness? I think we might be sadly surprised. No wonder Satan reaches us. No wonder he gets us. There's nothing we have to withstand. And we forget what was said in Ephesians 6 about putting on the whole armor of God. That's my job, to know the armor and put it on and then use it rightly. So the calamity of Esau is to be a vain person, simply not to value what is to be valued, but to value something that's passing and really doesn't amount to anything when it comes to, in his case, the birthright. Well, what is the birthright of the Christian? We talked about being born of water and the Spirit. We're new creatures in Christ. We rise from the water to the grave of baptism, babes in Christ. If we do what we should, we grow into manhood, spiritual maturity. And that birthright's heaven. But it's going to take our application of the truth that we can mature and grow. And it takes concentration, it takes meditation, it takes ability to rebuke oneself, it takes ability to teach others and encourage others to work to teach the truth and to defend it. So the question is is there calamity out there? Awaiting us like the calamity of Esau and for the reason that he failed? Or are we doing what we can to stop such a calamity from coming upon us? Ultimately and finally, the terrible eternal calamity is to hear, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. How that would ring down through the years and the ears of the lost. And never, never will cease. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, I don't think there's anybody here who's not a Christian that doesn't know what to do to become one. It's just a matter of whether you will or you won't. And in this invitation song, and as I offer this one to give you an opportunity at this point to obey the gospel, you're going to say, yes, I will, or no, God, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I know Christ died for me. I know, God, you love me. I know you've made provision. 
but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stay right here. Well, you're preparing for that calamity. You're hardening your heart a little more. And it can reach that stage there to where Jesus himself stood here right now preaching. If I no fault with his preaching, you'd reject him. Many did. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.